February 21st. Work felt like it went by in a blink of an eye today. I felt a mixture of apprehension and excitement towards the new experience, despite the warnings I've received. I've never done anything fun or exciting, and even though it was like going from a nerf battle to Afghanistan, I couldn't help but feel alive. Ironic, I know. I walked home after work, adrenaline beginning to course through my body, and when I got to my apartment, I couldn't sit still. I had packed all my bags last night, so I went through everything and checked once more that it was all there. It was supposed to be. It all was. I'm just waiting now, since the instruction said to arrive at the airport at 8. I'm a little restless, and I know I probably should be at least a little scared, but I'm guessing that'll kick in soon enough. This is just the most exciting thing I've ever done in, well, my life, probably. I don't think I've even left the state before, and now I'm going halfway across the country with people that would kill me for saying the wrong thing. It's okay. It's pretty scary, man. I need to get out of my head, I'm going for a walk. I managed to pass the time, and at 7.30, I took my bags downstairs and called a cab. I gave him the directions, and now I'm waiting. I think I've settled on sort of a mellow excitement, because this is definitely a scary experience, but at the same time, it's novel and intriguing. I wonder what the airport will be like. I don't recall there being anything in the area. Maybe it's hidden, like the bar. This is absolutely crazy. The directions led to this private little airstrip where, at first glance, the only barricade between us and it was a little booth with a bar blocking the road. However, when we pulled up to it, the interior was incredibly high-tech. There was a wall of monitors, all showing feeds from cameras set up across the compound, and there was an array of weapons on the back wall. I explained why I was there, and he said the cab driver couldn't go any further. He pointed me towards the hangar at the beginning of the runway, and I could just barely see a few shapes milling around that as I got closer was revealed to be the group. They were busy preparing the plane, which was quite the shock to me. I was expecting some sort of passenger plane, maybe even a private jet, but this was small. I doubt it could hold more than 10 people, so we were all comfortable, but barely so, especially with the gear strewn around about the cabin. Tivia is flying, so her and Zephen are in the cockpit, but the rest of us are just sitting in the cabin. It's been about 20 minutes, and Edward's telling us we should get some sleep. So I'll do that for the rest of the flight. There is not much else to do. I mean, I brought a magazine, but no one else is doing anything, so I don't want to seem like the odd man out. I'll update again when I get the chance. February 22nd, Edward woke us up very early this morning and told us we were about 20 minutes out from the job site. Then he walked over to the back of the plane, pulled down a hanging screen, and a map of Cody Township, South Dakota, appeared. This is our location, he began, his accent seemingly accentuated by the nature of his speech. As I'm sure you've all expected, perhaps Zephen read in the briefing, the reports have mostly come from this forest on the banks of the White River. At that, he pointed to an area about a mile in size, consisting of a dense forest tucked into a bend in the long, windy river. We have obtained access to a cabin within the forest, and that is where we will be staying for the duration of the job. Wait a minute, I interjected. We're staying in the forest where the monsters are. That doesn't seem very safe, does it? Generally speaking, these talks go without interruption. I'd like to keep it that way, Edward said, and I thought better of continuing the discourse. Now, as some of you may know, Wendigos rely heavily on changes in scenery for tracking. They are very perceptive of things like slight imprints 
in the ground where someone has walked, residue of breath in the air, or especially human waste, which is why it is imperative that you only use one of the bathrooms within the cabin, unless otherwise directed by me and me alone. The first day will be purely reconnaissance. We will be establishing cameras here, here, and here, and here, and sensors every 50 meters and 85 meters perimeter around the cabin. We will then wire every feed into the surveillance room, which has been prepared in the basement of the cabin, and then we will wait. Unless they are abnormally hungry, Windigos tend to hunt at night, so sundown tonight will be when we make our first move, if they do not do so. Upon landing, each of you will receive a map of the forest with markings designating the camera and sensor locations, along with the cabin and where we believe the den to be. We cannot plan for what will happen tomorrow, as it depends entirely upon what happens today. Any questions? He looked directly at me and at that, and I shook my head. Excellent. We should be landing shortly. After Edward had briefed us, the group began to talk quietly amongst themselves, and Edward came over to sit next to me. In a low voice, he said, I know you're well aware of this by now, but there is a very good chance you won't come out of this in one piece, and we can't afford to coddle you like a rookie normally would be. The best we can do is try and make sure you're never alone, but even that won't take precedence over getting the job done. Thanks, I guess, I replied, not really sure how to respond. I suppose if I go down out here, it'll at least be more exciting than if Agent Osborne had taken me out behind the shed and put a bullet in me. He raised an eyebrow but didn't say anything. In other words, yes, I've made peace with my maker. I'm pretty sure where I'm headed when the lights go out, I said. Then he told me probably the most disconcerting thing I've heard in my entire life. You have no idea where you're going, trust me, I've been there. Then he stood and walked up to the cockpit without another word. I've been trying to figure out what he meant by it ever since, and to be honest, I don't have a clue. It was only about 15 minutes before we landed, and it was an airstrip similar to the one we'd flown out of. After we landed, a long stretch limousine pulled up in front of us, and a woman stepped out. She wore sunglasses despite the early hour, and she introduced herself as our employer. She said that, well, it is unusual for employers to introduce themselves personally to the employees in this business. This was an unusual scenario. I'm not sure if she was talking about me or something I don't know about yet. But this past hour has been a whirlwind. On top of the hurricane the past week has been, and I'm barely staying afloat. After she exchanged some words with Edward, she turned back to us and said we'd be leaving momentarily. I figured we'd take the limo, but after she introduced herself, she led us to an old beat-up sedan, and Edward told us that was our vehicle. Now everyone else is talking about the job. I've heard a few bets going around on who would get killed first, and there was even an over-under on how many of us would make it out. But I had the same uneasy feeling I had earlier. I sat in the back quietly, which seemed to throw off the big European guy. I forgot his name. He looked at me funny for a while, then he began to look around, simply observing things. He's very scary, to be honest. In fact, I'm pretty sure he's reading this over my shoulder as I'm writing too. We are at the edge of the woods right now. It's around 9 in the morning, and Edward's going through all our stuff one last time to make sure we all brought everything. He says, once we go in, we're not coming back out until the job is done, so we'd better have everything we needed. I know I do, and I'm pretty sure these guys do as well, so there shouldn't be any problems. The difference between the forest and the outside is like night and day. The trees are packed together incredibly tightly. 
even encroaching on the small dirt road at times, and they block out almost all sun, except for when it filters through the leaves, spraying tiny rays of light down upon us on occasion. It wasn't a gradual shift either. It was like we entered the forest, someone had turned a switch. The mood once again changed as well. We were quiet now, on edge. Every blade of grass, every leaf, every branch seemed like it was being taken in by these outsiders. The big guy next to me keeps looking over at me though. He's freaking me out. It was only a 10 minute drive from the edge of the forest to our cabin, but it felt a lot longer. Something about this place seems off. It doesn't feel like a normal forest. Something I can put my finger on is that there's no sound. No birds are chirping. No sticks are breaking under the feet of animals. There's just the occasional sound of leaves rustling with the breeze, and the methodical sounds of the group unpacking inside. I should probably go get my stuff ready. I just wanted to get acclimated to the forest. It's around noon now, so we'll probably have some food, then get out to start setting up the sensors for tonight. It's about four now, and we're working on setting up the surveillance. I got paired off with Tavia Stewart, the one that flew the plane, and she's, well, more normal than everyone else, I suppose. It was after lunch when Edward told us the assignments, and when we were prepared, she came over to me. Looks like I got the rookie, she said, slightly raising her eyebrow. I was initially nervous that she was annoyed or even resentful that she obtained the added burden of someone with no experience, but she then laughed and the tension quickly dissipated. Don't worry, as long as everything goes according to plan and you follow instructions, it'll all be fine. I can deal with following instructions, I replied, but what happens if something doesn't go according to plan? She sighed for a moment. You're getting down to it, aren't you? If something goes wrong, we improvise, which is why if that happens, you'll be in a spot of trouble because you have nothing with which to base your improvisations off of. Let's hope everything goes to plan then, I said, a dark mood settling in once more. Quickly, she nodded her head in the direction we'd been assigned. Come on, we better get going. I followed along, and we struck up conversation. It was a pleasing reprieve from the oddness of the rest of the trip. When we spoke, it almost seemed like it was just a walk in the forest, and that, combined with the density of trees providing a challenge to navigate, provided ample distraction from the horrors that lay within it. But then we arrived at our first location. When we got there, she removed her pack and set it on the ground. It was like a crash landing to reality. When she extracted the sensor and began inputting some perimeter information into the keypad, as she was affixing it to a tree, suddenly a loud sharp screech sounded from somewhere behind us causing me to jump. Was that one of them? I asked suddenly on high alert. Sure sounded like it, she replied. I mean, a lot of cryptids have that call, but it makes the most sense that it was a Wendigo considering we're here to hunt them. I thought they were only awake at night. What are they doing up now, I asked. They only hunt at night, she corrected. They tend not to sleep a lot. It just keeps getting worse. I looked around, taking in our location, and especially making note of where the sound had come from. I judged it to be around a few hundred feet in the direction the sensor was facing, so I assumed it to be the den, or at least a commonly traveled spot by these creatures. You ready to go? Tiva asked as she hoisted the pack once more. That's it, this is a quick task. Yeah, I mumbled, not paying her much attention. I was in survival mode. It was as if the call had awakened something primal in me. 
something left over from when we were bashing rocks together to make weapons. I've taken the time while Tavi's setting up the second sensor to write this, and I'm beginning to feel strange. This primal fear has heightened my senses and flooded me with a sense of invincibility, almost to the point where I anticipate the moment the creatures make their attack. It's an enjoyable feeling, if I were to be honest, and one that is entirely new to me. I noticed everything. My reflexes are at their peak. The anticipation will likely fade by tonight, but I believe that I am ready. As we walked from the fourth to the final sensor, we came across a well-trodden path. The road we came in on was the only path marked on the map, so I'm not sure where this one came from, but I have an idea. There were hoof prints packing down the dirt, along with other sets of prints I didn't recognize, so it could be a hunting path used by the creatures. The hoof prints could be something they hunt, and I assume the creatures themselves have made the ones I don't recognize. We're almost done now, Tavia just finished setting up the last sensor, and we're going to begin the walk home soon. The sun's beginning to set as well, so it's nearly perfect timing. When we were just about at the cabin, there was another screech. It sounded like it was from the same area as the last one, but it sounded different. Not the screech itself, it was certainly from the same creature, but the way it was delivered. It seemed angry, provoked even. Tivia and I met back up with the rest of the group in front of the cabin, and in some sort of odd final to the wide array of emotions I'd seen throughout this trip, everyone had their own. Edward was anticipating the hunt. Tivia was in a contemplative mood, presumably thinking of the possible outcomes. Frida was checking all of her weapons yet again, Lorenz, as I finally learned the large European's name, was standing silently, glaring at everything he looked at, and Zephin seemed to not know a mission was about to happen, as he threw a small stone in the general direction of an upstairs window until Edward told him to stop. I'm pretty sure he still doesn't like me, and I'm still not sure why. I'll have to give it more thought later though, as it's getting quite dark out now and Edwards just told me to go inside. Alright, it's 8 o'clock now, and it looks like it's going to be quite the boring night. The others have been going out on patrols sporadically, but they haven't run into any creatures. Since Edward claims he can't afford to have me wasting his time, he's put me in charge of watching the sensors and monitors and there has been absolutely nothing. It's been about two hours of this now, and boredom honestly poses the greatest danger to me as is. Nine o'clock now and still nothing. Ten o'clock is come and gone, and we have yet to encounter anything mildly spooky. It's 10.22 now. Lorenz just radioed in that he spotted one of them in his scope. And minutes later, I had three readings on my sensors. I told Edward about it, and he quickly went to Rose, Zephin, and Tivia, who had been sleeping during Lorenz and Frida's shift. On their way out, he told me they'd take care of the creatures, then they'd be right back, and to watch them on the monitors if I got worried. I'm not terribly worried about them. They probably know what they're doing, but... Three readings on the sensors. Lorenz wasn't patrolling within the range of the sensors. There were four creatures out there, and we'd only accounted for three. Now these aren't just heat sensors or something that can be tripped by anything with a beating heart. Edwards explained that they were established to track some sort of energy native to these creatures. If there's three blips on the radar, it's safe to assume that there's three things with the capability of doing some very bad things out there. To be honest, one more than expected probably isn't the worst thing in the world, but if there's four, why not five? Why not fifteen? 
Why not an army? They could be walking straight into a death trap. I have to do something. Hey guys, thank you for listening to today's Creepypasta, and I hope you enjoyed. I do have a podcast called the Murder House Radio Show. Check it out. The link will be in the description below. It is a true crime podcast. But if you did like, like, comment, subscribe, and share for more. Hit the bell notification when you subscribe and select all to get all notifications whenever I upload. I upload six days a week, Monday to Saturday, at least one video a day. Now all the long episodes in the full series of Creepypastas are on all major podcasting platforms under the name Deadly underscore Zone underscore Narrations. There will be a link in the description. Also, go follow all the social media accounts. They are in the description below. I do have a subreddit called Deadly Narrations. The link will be in the description. Also in the description below are the sources to the creepypasta and the music used, so go check those out. Let me know what creepypasta you would like to hear next, or if you have your own creepypasta you would like me to narrate, or if you have a creepypasta series you would like to hear, send them to me on any of the social medias in the DMs, or to my email address which is also in the description, or leave them in the comments below. Also in the description below is the author's social medias if they have any listed. But that's it for today's creepypasta. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time in the deadly zone, stay deadly and stay spooky.